people who are really competent will really express doubts about the extent of their knowledge because they have enough knowledge to know what they don't know. Well, hello, folks. You're back on the Faculty Factory podcast, and I'm your host, Kim Skorupski, here at Hopkins. And I'm looking at my colleague and mentor and friend, Dr. Cindy Rand. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Kim. Good to have a chance to chat, even if it's virtually. Well, I'm glad to have you back on the podcast, people of Faculty Factory. Cindy Rand was here back on episode number 65. If you want to scoop back and slide back on the menu, back in April 2020. And Dr. Rand is our Senior Associate Dean for Faculty in the Office of Faculty and is a professor in pulmonary and critical care medicine. No, pulmonary medicine. Pulmonary and critical care. Okay, right. And your your research, your whole NIH-funded career has been around um, adherence to treatment, to therapies, and patient Compliance. That's right. It's well, I would say that's the underlying theme. I would my my research is focused on the intersection between health and behavior and how uh, outcomes are influenced by what we say to patients and the experience patients have and how they understand and interpret what we've told them. And one of the places that took me was to look more closely at the role of health behavior in health disparities. Mm. Because I'm in pulmonary and critical care, uh, adherence with asthma therapy, respiratory therapies became a focus. But I would say the broad theme, since I'm trained as a psychologist, has been thinking about health and behavior. Well, let's talk about health and behavior, and let's talk about it in the context of what you and I one of our, our passions and our, and our loves is working with faculty, and you've received a number of mentoring awards over your career, and you mentor hundreds of people and are now a certified coach. And this is, um, I think the topic you want to talk about, it's been around, I've heard about it, you know, maybe a couple decades ago, and it's just still there and we can't get rid of it. Talk to us today about imposter syndrome. Well, Thank you, Kim. It it, it is something that I have recently had a chance to talk with a number of women leaders about, and and it's been a reoccurring theme through both my role as a mentor and my role as as an executive coach is what is it that people are telling themselves? What are their what is their own perception? as they advance in their careers about their competence, their suitability, do they fit in? Um, And the term most commonly used is imposter syndrome, but I'm gonna talk about that phrase in a moment. And and it typically is defined as an individual who believes that somehow or another, they have achieved what they've achieved by, by hoodwinking people, by some means, either by, they fooled people or they were given special preference or they in some by some means achieved what they achieved their their position in academic medicine their leadership role their title their receipt of awards they received it under really if people knew them they would know they were not deserving of it mm-hmm. and this construct of of somehow being really not as good as the people around you has a corrosive effect on confidence. It can limit people's ability to uh, seek new positions. It can limit their confidence in the positions that they are in. And it's a stressor. It's, It's an overall stressor to feel that somehow where you're at, you don't deserve to be there been striking to me, and and this is one can just look at the academic literature to see this, is how pervasive it is in academics. Academics, which is in, and this is not just in medicine, it's across the board, which is so much built around the idea of scholarship and knowledge and, and having some deep, deep competency in an area can lead people to look around their their landscape at their colleagues who seem so unbelievably smart, oh, so competent, 
And by making a comparison of themselves with this colleague or this leader, they uh, self-judge that I couldn't, I'm not nearly that smart. I'm not nearly that talented. I'm not nearly that, that knowledgeable about this topic. And it is perhaps even exacerbated by the fact that when you're in an environment with so many outstanding colleagues, you make these comparisons and we are a comparison culture, right? We do measure ourselves against the person sitting next to us or the person that we're listening to speaking. And, and what's what when you're in the position I'm in, when you get to talk to so many people, again, as a mentor and, and as an executive coach, what you realize is that there's really no point at which that goes away. There's no point. The highest level, at the very highest level, People self-question. They wonder whether or not if they really knew how many things I don't know, would they really let me be here? I really, there's, I can't believe I actually have this title. I mean, I'm, can you believe it, Kim? I'm senior associate dean for faculty. How the hell did that ever happen? <laughs> I mean, if people really knew, they would never, ever have appointed me there. I mean, and if they knew how many people were better mentors than me, that other people should have gotten those awards. I shouldn't have gotten those awards, right? I mean, it's maddening when I when I see this. I was Cindy. I was on a call, Zoom call earlier this week, and I was giving the slides and running the show. So when I give slides, I can't see all the the Brady Brunch boxes of people. But all of a sudden, someone spoke up and said that she felt like she was an imposter and struggled with it. And she was telling her story was being very candid and authentic. And I was scampering because I recognized the voice, but I'm like, that can't be her because she is, she is that person. And I'm like, no, it can't be her. It can't be her. And I finally got my slide, my uh, slides to go away so that I could see the box. And sure enough, it was her. And it, it just, in one hand, my heart was just so softened because it was such a, a bold move for her to say on this very public um, call with a lot of people, it was three screens of people, to say that. So I, w- I felt so, it was really encouraging and humbling to hear someone at that level admit that. And I was also so saddened at the same time to think like, when are when are we ever going to get over this? How, as you said, um, corrosive that if we if we didn't have that self doubt, she's already mm-hmm. amazing. Like how much more could she would she do if she didn't right. have that little voice up there? That's absolutely true, Kim. And and I want to say a few things as I've thought about this, and I've thought about both the the, the ubiquity of of this, I, and, and I. I mentioned before that I wanted to take a little bit of issue with the term imposter syndrome. So that's an old term. It's been around for a very long time, and it comes out of sort of the personality and the clinical psych world where imposter syndrome somehow implies some deficit, some some clinical or neurotic problem or some something that needs to be specifically treated because it's an it's an abnormality. Syndrome implies illness. It implies something. I, I think it's more perhaps accurate to say imposter phenomenon. Others have suggested that's a more accurate term. And, and there are a couple of factors that are key in understanding it. One is that our, our culture and our social norms are powerful in creating the expectations of who should be a leader. Who should be in academics? We look at people's gender. We look at their race. We look at them physically. We make decisions about, well, who should be? What what do typical leaders look like? Let's take a a division chief or a department chair. Well, if I look around in in my own environment, certainly until recently, they were all white males. And if I, as as a woman, were going to step into that, there weren't a lot of role models. There weren't a lot of examples. I would have been aberrant. So part of what we do is look for, is this expected? If, if, if I'm here and I look so different and I'm not like those people who are supposedly the experts and supposedly the ones who, who should be here, does that mean that I'm here 
uh, by some some. Am I am I yeah. was I here? And it could be just it could be personal doubt. It could be maybe I was advanced as because they wanted a woman. Maybe I was put here for other reasons. So that again adds to the corrosive doubt. But that is a that is a cultural factor around what we see and how we communicate, right? We 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 look at what's around us and and very little of our communication calls out the fact that those are those are historical norms. Those are things that were shaped by by racism and 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 sexism and, and a whole range of other things. And that's just a, a tip of the iceberg, the ways in which culture shape us. So when we talk about feeling out of place, feeling like we are an imposter in the setting, pause and look around and think about how many role models have you personally had and what conversations have you had with those role models about their own experiences? So your friend or your the, the, the colleague that you saw presenting did something important, and that is to talk about how common this is to make it normal. And when you see someone who is competent and you see someone who you know is outstanding in their position, and yeah, I'd be better. I, I would wish for them that they feel more, more uh, belonging. And, and I hope we work towards creating more belonging environments, but it, it should be something you listen to and realize, aha, here's a competent person. Here's someone who I respect what they do. If they are having these feelings, obviously these feelings are not necessarily uh, accurate in terms of they're much more apt to be shaped by what are role models and what we've learned about how people approach new positions and how they process internally. Which brings me to the second point I want to make about imposter phenomenon, and that is I've mentioned the culture will shape what we think is normative. It will it will shape what our role models are and whether we think we should be in these positions. But the other thing that plays a, an important role is a principle in psychology talking about attribution. So the fundamental attribution error, the fundamental attribution error, which is sort of a classic, a psych 101 social psych, is that we tend to make dispositional attributions to others and situational attributions to ourselves. So when I'm looking at someone else, I don't have the information about what they're thinking. We don't, I don't know their doubts. I don't know necessarily the challenges they have, but I know my own. I know intimately my own insecurities. I know that you know I may be anxious when I have to speak, or I, I know that I may uh, really question my writing ability, or I may feel not uh, at ease with certain tasks that are given me, but I don't see that for other people. So when they appear competent, when I watch someone speak confidently, when I watch somebody lead confidently, I don't have access to that information. So I am more apt to attribute it that they have those skills, they have that confidence. It's really just a, a limitation of we know ourselves better than we know other people. Yeah. So what's the solution? What, what, how do we overcome that? Again, this to increase the sense of inclusion and the sense of belonging and the sense that this is normal to have doubts and to have to learn new things when you do new things, we need to communicate more about the process and communicate more about the fact that really when you enter any next step of your career, whether that's taking on your first faculty position out of your fellowship or taking on a leadership role in a division or, or becoming a dean, you're taking on a new portfolio that of course you're not competent at. This I actually find for those who have are inclined to imposter phenomenon is somehow they believe that one should be fully competent before one takes on these roles. No, it doesn't work that way. You take on these roles and you become competent, but you have talents, you have energy, you, ha you work hard, you have the capacity to do this. So don't, don't misperceive how leadership happens. Leadership and advancement in any career requires taking that leap and learning how to do it. 
And that is that is so fundamental. You will acquire greater confidence. You will acquire greater competence as you practice these skills. And you have a community that helps you do that. But no one starts out knowing all of those things. And, and, and here's an interesting juxtaposition. So imposter phenomenon. Do you know what the opposite of imposter phenomenon is? Ever heard of Dunning-Kruger? Dunning-Kruger effect? No. Dunning-Kruger is another psychological construct where some of the least competent people are most apt to overrate their own capacities. People who are really competent will really express doubts about the extent of their knowledge because they have enough knowledge to know what they don't know. So Dunning-Kruger is that phenomenon when you get a complete imbecile who thinks they are, you know, absolutely the bee's knees and knows how to do everything. And that's the Peter principle, right? People rise to it, the it, level it, of incompetence. It, 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 you know, when you see Dunning-Kruger effect, you you just scratch your head because, you know, lots of studies have just shown that that those who who rate their ability the highest, again, these are these are generalizations, but those who rate their ability the highest are far less apt to perform at the level of those who have more self-critical judgment of being able to gauge what their limitations are. So, you know, they're both extremes. Imposter phenomenon and Dunning-Kruger are maybe neither places you want to be, but they do underscore the fact that it's good to recognize what you need to learn. That's okay. It's okay to understand where your strengths are. There's a difference between, between having confidence and having competence. You can have confidence even when you're still acquiring competence. Mm. That is what the process is of developing as a leader. And as you look around the landscape, as you look around at the leaders that you most admire, remind yourself that they too have had to go through this process. They as human beings have had those doubts still have those doubts, still have that learning process, still have areas where they need to grow and develop. I was reading a quote, which I can't exactly, I can't exactly quote for a podcast. This was by uh, Michel uh, de Montagne, who is a Renaissance French philosopher. And and I'm going to paraphrase him now, but what he said is, um, philosophers and kings poop, as do women. And that is meant to convey, it was, he didn't say poop, but (laughs) to convey that people are human and they all have these elements of being human, right? That they too have doubts. So, and, and their own perception of their own skills, flaws, whatever they're made up of are like yours. Hmm. They're like yours. And if they don't have them, then they probably have Dunning-Kruger, right? (laughs) Well, Cindy, this is so genius, as usual, coming out of your mouth. I like, you're making me think of what um, our colleague Jennifer Haythorn-Waite talks about in the leadership courses, this idea of social comparison, where we compare our innards to people's outards and determine that we are inferior. Because just as you said, we're looking at the outside veneer and we are, giving them all these uh, this praise without recognizing, we're comparing like our CV now to theirs now and with their big leader, rather than saying, well, when you big, fancy, famous leader were at my stage, what did your CV look like then? So the appropriate level of comparison is, is, is the importance there because we have to make sure we're looking at... Um, similar ranks and stages and seasons of life. So that's what I think is an important lesson in about comparing social comparison. The other thing that I wanted that you're making me think of is that, you know, I'm a person of faith, but God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So the idea of you, you when you said earlier that many people, men, many of us think that we have to meet all the job specifications before we apply for it, because otherwise I'm not worthy of that position Mm -hmm. rather than what you pointed out so nicely. Um, You're not necessarily hold all the skills now, but you have the capacity, you have the confidence 
and you will learn and grow in competence once you're in the job. So I like that reminder also that sometimes that imposter phenomenon can result in our, as you said earlier, that corrosive effect of losing opportunities because we we feel like we're not capable at this moment in time without recognizing, no, you're not, um, you don't have to be done right. to get right. it. You know, you're going to grow into it. That's right. And, and it, you know, it's, it, part of what I think is, is um, very effective growth into leadership is, is to have the humility to recognize where you do need to grow. I'll, I'll use an example of something I see with regularity. In fact, it's, a, it's an absolute given as you advance in academics, if you move into leadership of a division or a department, is I've yet to meet anybody who's gone into those roles who has really sufficient uh, experience with budgets and dealing with the financial side. I mean, it's a very rare person. Typically, we select people on one basis and then ask them to do other things. Right. But what I have observed is that Again, with humility and the right partnerships, you will gain the skills you need. Mm -hmm. Go back to something you said earlier about comparisons around looking at um, leaders and and making comparisons of yourself to those leaders and thinking about think about the stage that you're in. And I think that's absolutely right. And I would add that people people develop and advance their careers in different ways with different strengths. So your particular portfolio, your particular set of skills at any given stage may not look like your neighbors. You may not, for example, be somebody who is absolutely knocking them out of the park with six publications a year. That may not be your forte. However, you may be exceptionally good at grant writing, or you may be exceptionally good at mentoring, or you may have other capacities that when you team with others who have complementary skills, together you may make very, very good science or build a very, a very good program. So I would I would add to that comment about don't compare at outside of your range. I would also think about the fact that we need diversity in our skills. We need diversity in our people. We need diversity in our, our talents. And, and I think successful leaders, people who successfully advance in academics, appreciate what they can do. They appreciate where their gifts are. That's an important thing to understand. They appreciate where they may not be their their overriding skills may not be in a given area and they find the right partners mm-hmm. and work together and and as a community as an academic community talking about this and sharing and discussing these diverse pathways to success is hugely important my career path is was nothing like my my division chief's path, and it was nothing like the my department chair's path, and right. and we we complement each other. So um, comparisons, we we are a comparison based uh, society, and we tend to line up whether it's the our our weight or our our strength or our height or our IQ or our CVs. We want to compare a. In, in real life, it's much more complex than that. And, and one can succeed and have a fulfilling and rich life in academics with really a tremendous variety of, of skills and talents. Good mentors, and this is another place you know, I've talked in the past about mentors. One of the roles your mentors can play, your mentor can play if you uh, if, if you probe and ask them about this, if they're not volunteering, is to help you understand where your great strengths are. Yeah. It, it's good to give feedback to your mentees about where they need to grow and develop. But I have to actually say that learning where your strengths are, that is, you know, let that win behind your back because 
you know, Kim, you're an extrovert. You have the capacity to to communicate. You have the capacity to uh, launch yourself into a project. You should you should and have built your career by by letting that wind behind your back of your natural talents move you forward. Right. If you can't yourself identify that, engage your mentor, engage others in helping you understand what do I already got that's going to help move me forward and yet helps to get some of those other other skills in the portfolio. But but uh, I think you move the swiftest if you if you I'm going to mix my metaphors here, but you know you you move the swiftest, right? If you if you have your sails set for the wind you've got, right? Let take advantage of that. Don't don't be tacking when you can be whatever the other term is. <laughs> I'm not there either. I'm, I'm frantically looking through my sticky notes. I'm I'm high input. And so I always have sticky notes, but there's something you, you're making me reflect on is that the greatest gift we can give to another is not a is not some tangible thing that we give them, but rather to expose their hidden talents. That is yep. the greatest gift we can give to somebody else. And you're also making a lot, the underlying theme of what I'm hearing you say is emotional intelligence. And that is knowing our strengths, knowing our blind spots, knowing ourselves to better manage ourselves that will then help us to appreciate and know others to manage those relationships. I think that's fundamental fundamental to um, growing. And as you're saying, like gathering people and mentorship and bringing people on with you as you go to these next leadership positions. I'm wondering if you would help me think about um, something here, because you've been talking about the imposter phenomenon, attribution error, our confidence, our competence. And I'm seeing this as all of, what can I do? You know, you've, you've imparted a lot of wisdom of what I can do to readjust and build up my confidence and competence. What obligation do others have to helping manage, recognize, normalize this phenomenon? So it's all so far, it's all been like what we can do to acknowledge it, improve it, mitigate it. But is there any obligation among the leadership, a culture, an institution, a mentoring team to recognize that it's there and to do something to help minimize that? That's a great question. And, you know, I think if your goal as a a leader, as an institution is to optimize the success of, of everyone in your organization, then, yeah, there is, you know, it's, it's to your advantage to, to think about how, these hidden barriers, and I would describe imposter phenomenon as a hidden barrier to very talented people who could do so much to advance any number of areas within our organization who don't seek those out, who don't pursue them because they don't feel that they are able to. And and I would say one I've already mentioned, which is we need to think about role models. We need to think about who are people looking at, right? So one role that that diversity plays beyond the obvious contributions that diverse perspectives and diverse people bring to an organization, which is well evidence-based, is the fact that it, it provides opportunities for younger faculty, younger members of the organization to realize that that Leadership comes in lots of different flavors. They comes in lots of different packages. That's one area. The other I would say is thinking about forums and settings where leaders are explicitly asked and and encouraged to talk about the process of their own journey that incorporates uh, exploration for men, women, for all others that talks about and what were your challenges and and how did you feel and how did you overcome them i think it's very helpful to recognize the warts and insecurities and and humanness of the people who who lead mm-hmm. uh, you know i've i work with really the smartest people in the world i mean i i if you come to johns hopkins you know you 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 just you're tripping over them. They're like everywhere. Exactly. And and I, I'm in awe 
of the capacity of so many people. Capacity, and, and this is not imposter phenomenon, this is me saying in, in this instance, I would say with a great deal of accuracy that some of their talents and skills are not ones I have. I don't have them. I have others, mm-hmm. have others. And, and, and as a part of a community, as a group, we complement each other and I bring value, mm-hmm. even though there are things they do, I just couldn't do. That's okay. And, and that element of understanding mm-hmm. that we need these different roles we need these different people is hugely liberating. It is a very, it, it suddenly you realize, yeah, I, I wouldn't be here, but for the fact that I've got this and I've got these capacities and these can bring value. Yeah. That's wind. That's the wind on my back that I'm, I'm going with. Cindy, I'm, I, I so agree with you. I'm so excited to hear you say this because this is to me, you, I know have been in meetings where all you have to do sometimes is say to somebody, Cindy, you and your, you know, skatingly brilliant ideas, or you, Monica, the way nobody runs faculty senate meetings the way you do, or you, Jennifer, you are the the mentoring guru. Any kind of any time we authentically acknowledge someone's Mm -hmm. value and why they're there, you can almost see people feel pride that they own that, that, oh, you not only is that right, but you see me, you get me, you understand me. And that recognition, I think, is sometimes what our obligation is as leaders and colleagues and tribe members is to call out that good stuff and reward that, acknowledge it and say, no, you're here for a reason. I can't do what you do, Cindy. You know, and, and, and actually that phrase you used is, is, is perfect. You're here for a reason. You bring. So it's not solely that you have this skill or you have this talent, but that in this setting is incredibly valuable. And that in combination together, look at what we could accomplish. I I think that was one of my my big epiphanies when I was a mid-level faculty is that, you know, I I had particular ways of approaching research that were added value. I was I was pretty good at critiquing grants. I was pretty good at understanding you know, I, I am methodologically really sound. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who whips papers out, you know, like, like a, a printing press, right? I mean, a, I have too much of a perfectionist streak in some areas that it just sort of slows me down, but I am a good partner. And, and that idea that there are different strengths, different capacities, I think takes it takes imposter phenomenon and it diffuses it to some extent because if you can understand the diversity and of of value and contributions you can look at yourself and and take a moment to pause to say i bring this to the table that and recognizing that the people that are all around you that you're admiring that they too have had their doubts and they too have had their struggles and that they they have areas where they're just not that great, you know, that they would not be as competent as you at doing this. So, so there's both an institutional obligation. I want to, I want to make certain that we, we lead, we, we end this conversation by re-emphasizing the fact that this is not a psychological deficit. This is not a, a syndrome, right? This is, this is actually so ubiquitous and so common that we could almost call it, I don't know, it's just part of the academic landscape, but it is it is probably unnecessary if we did a better job of communicating what the process is of advancing and this idea of the multiple talents, multiple intelligences, multiple competencies, and the idea that very, very often you have to be in a place to actually have the reasons to learn the skills to become good at it. So all taken together, I I think we would rather be, I I would prefer we have no imposter uh, phenomenon, but it can be used to your advantage if you can use it as a stepping stone for this sort of self-awareness, right? But but touch base with others, make sure you got input on it. 
we don't want Dunning Kruger. We 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 want we want people to be realistic, to assess their areas where their competence could be enhanced, but no, don't lack confidence because you're here for a reason. You have many talents, and if you have to learn how to run budgets to be a division chief, that's what you do. It's all acquirable. Love it. I love it. Dr. Cindy Rand, you've been great. I've learned so much from you, as I always do. Folks, now you know what I'm talking about. Cindy is right. We are thick with genius here at Hopkins, and it is a blessing. Thank you, Cindy. Talk to you later. Everybody come My pleasure, back. Kim. Thank you. Hello, Faculty Factory listeners. It's your friendly podcast producer here, Casey Callanan. Just to remind you, if you didn't already know it, the Faculty Factory is now offering coaching. You can learn more by visiting facultyfactory.org slash coaching. Faculty Factory Coaching is about building a thriving clinical, educational, and research career to be successful beyond all your expectations. Most of all, it's about living a joy-filled life. To learn more about Faculty Factory Coaching, drop us a line over at facultyfactory.org front slash coaching, and you can learn more there. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.